Hi, my name is Jodie Russell. I'm at, from the University of Edinburgh and I'll be presenting my paper called Psychiatry as Shaping Disordered Minds. To give you a quick overview of the kind of four key premises of this argument, um, I would say, summarize them as such. So mind shaping tells us that the tools that we use to understand each other are deeply prescriptive and normative and more behavior and experience. If the medical sciences such as psychiatry use folk psychological categories to understand mental disorder, it may be shaping patient experience and behavior, and this may have negative consequences. I'm going to argue quite explicitly that I think psychiatric concepts are folk psychological categories, as the mind shaping view describes them. Uh, and this means that psychiatric concepts therefore shape the cognition of the people the concepts seek to pick out with potentially bad consequences. So in order to kind of support these premises, uh, I will go through four different sections. So first, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of some of the broad uh, concepts of, of psychiatric kinds of psychiatric concepts kind of in play. Um, and then I will kind of like um, orientate myself within that kind of framework. And then I will explain the mind shaping thesis um and how that supports the thesis that psychiatry uh uses folk psychological kinds or uh psychiatric concepts are folk psychological and they shape minds uh and lastly i will draw some conclusions from this uh premise so um as i kind of understand the literature there are kind of three main um types of psychiatric concepts at play there is a naturalist normative and even hybrid accounts of what um, mental disorders are. So um, most importantly, we have the kind of naturalist view, which is a view that I will tend to turn to the most in and criticize the most. So what all naturalist approaches seem to have in common is this general conceptualization of their project as uncovering what mental disorders are in nature. Um, so their project is mostly kind of like descriptive, kind of like this idea of um, we're, we're discovering and learning about what is already present in the world. Um, so importantly, values don't and shouldn't determine what we call a disorder. Nature determines what is a disorder and what is not a disorder. Um, and more recently, people have been kind of critical of this point of view. Um, and I term those views the, the normativists. And they argue that norms are necessarily involved in defining terms like disorder and dysfunction. Um, and this comes from a kind of like um, a point of view of, of historic um, use of the terms disorder and dysfunction in order to kind of label um, conditions that don't uh, seem like obvious candidates for what we want to call a mental disorder. Instead, they've been used to kind of like pick out things that were either kind of like socially stigmatized or considered kind of um, a bad things for one to have in a social context rather than actual cases of natural disorder. So instances, for example, uh, in earlier editions of the DSM, we have criteria for homosexuality. Uh, more recently, we have criteria uh, that covers grief experiences. Um, and these seem to be instances where um, the values and norms of the particular social context of the people who develop these criteria have um, played a part in the defining those as disorders, but those seem to be kind of suspicious cases. Um, and so they're very critical, the normativists are very critical of uh, value-free models of disorder. Um, Jerome Wakefield, on, on the other hand, is kind of critical of extremes in the other direction. Um, so he criticizes the wholly value-laden concepts of mental disorder arguing that normativists who argue that these concepts are completely value-laden overlook the explanatory and epistemic role that disorder attribution plays, and thus our concepts do more than simply delineate the, the undesirable. And as such, Wakefield proposes a kind of hybrid account, as I call it, uh, which takes the best of both worlds. See, he has a partially naturalist, part partially normativist account. Um, in his own criteria kind of rests on an evolutionary understanding of function that builds the naturalist arm uh, and a socially embedded concept of harm which builds on his normativist arm. Um, and we can kind of see similar hybrid accounts in, in activism as well. Very recently with Dahan and Nielsen, 
we're trying to integrate values into an account of a naturalistic uh, concept of disorder. Um, but this is kind of where I feel like um, more work needs to be kind of done to understand the role of values. Um, I feel like these hybrid accounts thus far underplay the role of values, which I think was captured slightly more appropriately in the normativist case. So in the normativist case, they think that values are playing this active role in determining what we call a disorder. Um, and values do seem to play some kind of part in constructing what counts as a disorder or not. They don't just reflect the interests of the individual uh, we've already diagnosed this disorder. They seem to have this kind of like regulative role um, or this kind of prescriptive role. And so I will argue instead that these values and norms directly influence the natural phenomena these accounts claim to map and shape human experience in prescriptive ways. Um, in order to do so, I will be leaning on the mind shaping account. Um, so in under mind shaping, um, it, which is primarily a count of social cognition, uh, we understand social understanding social cognition as being regulative and prescriptive. So the mind shaping view is a thesis about how we understand other people. We understand them by conforming or getting them to conform to certain norms. And this is important for social coordination tasks. Um, tasks that include things like agreeing on what food is or what predator is. These are the kinds of things that we need to have a kind of like shared understanding of uh, in order for us to work together to overcome particular hurdles or, or problems or achieve particular goals that things in the environment propose. So we have an essentially invested interest in trying to understand each other for the sake of trying to work together which means that social cognition and social understanding is not just about learning passively what another person is thinking. It's not solely epistemic goal. There are these kind of like non-epistemic and social um, reasons to be partaking in, in shaping processes. And this is achieved through setting up expectations. And we can set up expectations by categorizing people uh, using folk psychological categories. Um, so folk psychological categories are kind of understood under mind shaping to be very broad and they include things like stereotypes and tropes and even socialized concepts like emotions. And we apply these uh, categories to people. We, we um, try and delineate them as being kinds of people uh, to get them to conform to the expectations built into those folk psychological categories. So for example, when I walk into a bookshop, the book seller, the person behind the counter, is already categorizing me as potential book buyer. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a customer. Um, and so my awareness of that as an agent and equally my um, the bookseller behind the counter also being an agent, uh, we're going to confer expectations upon each other. Um, as a book buyer, I'm kind of expected to kind of like look at the books and maybe buy something. Uh, I'm not expected to like deface the books or uh, steal the books. And likewise, if I do want to buy a book, I expect the bookseller to take my money. Um, maybe I expect of them a certain amount of information because they are more knowledgeable than I, um, those kinds of things. Um, and so what we have when we have multiple agents kind of like trying to understand each other is we develop something called a folk psychological spiral where my behavior can be categorized in a certain way and me being categorized makes me categorize others in a particular way and behave in response to them. And then they can then in kind respond to that. Um, and that's what develops this kind of like spiral dance of, of behavior and, and norm attribution. Um, what's kind of like important also about this kind of book buying example is that these folk psychological categories also seem to kind of constrict or make possible certain avenues for action. So because I've been categorized as a book buyer, that opens up opportunities for me to partake in book buying norms. I can exchange money meaningfully and take an item from the shop. Um, but it excludes certain possibilities from me. I can't go into the shop and expect to loan a book 
that would seem to be inappropriate given a situation where I'm expected to buy something or, or not or leave. Um, likewise, it would be really strange if I went into the into the shop and I asked to buy, you know, um, a stick of gum instead of a book. Um, so the fact that the, the, the situation is also physically constructed in a particular way and norms are in play given that uh, my avenues for action are restricted in particular ways and that encourages me along with the expectations to conform in particular ways um, and this becomes relevant when it comes to talking about mental disorders because what I suspect is kind of going on there is when we uh, apply concepts of mental disorder to people we're doing so for similar epistemic purposes um, so we're doing so for, for social understanding and this means that our concepts of a mental disorder are going to come with similar kind of prescriptive baggage which may inform and shape experience of the individual being categorized so now it's for me to kind of like establish that i think that psychiatric concepts are folk psychological categories and i think we can take one step in that direction by uh, claiming that um, psychiatric categories involve uh, normative and prescriptive forces and they're not merely descriptions of phenomena but they are but medical uh, sciences like psychiatry um, are also in the business of kind of um, delineating people for human interest um, and I think that the evidence for that can kind of come from two places both from uh, feminist philosophy of science and from history of medicine so feminist philosophers of science argue that scientific research is influenced by both epistemic and non-epistemic values and therefore not simply in the business of uncovering joints in nature separate from human interest um, and we can see examples of this for example in criticisms that the developers of the dsm have received for their kind of like financial interest in pharmaceutical injuries in, in industries um, from that perspective like the what's kind of like shaping the development of the cognitive tools that those psychiatrists use is not just the uncovering of natural facts they also have this kind of like vested financial interest involved and that therefore informs what particular take or what particular concept of disorder they would develop it's far more lucrative for instance to take a kind of naturalist concept of conception of disorder than to take a normative conception um, and secondly we can see this evidence in uh, the history of the medical institutions in the UK as described by Sadler and Sadler characterizes this history as a struggle um, a struggle for power between different ideologies with different conceptions of what medicine is um, either medicine as an art or medicine as a science uh, and this has led to medicine being practiced in the past in two different ways uh, before it eventually became standardized and when it did become standardized medicine then transitioned solely into becoming something that was practiced as a science and also practiced as a science by particular individuals who were trained at particular institutions so what the history of medicine tells us in this particular kind of case study is that um, science is heavily involved in not just kind of like the uncovering of particular truths but who is doing that uncovering in what context are they doing it how are they doing it what kind of theoretical tools are they using to do that kind of work so for better or for worse science is conducted by people who have, an in have other interests than just learning about nature and who themselves must coordinate on social tasks so for example standardizing science defining the domain of science who does science these all constitute um, social tasks that scientists might do so doing the science itself is a social coordination task and this gives us an in principle reason to think that science has its foundation uh, in processes for social understanding that help regulate what science is and the conceptual tool set as an extension of the cognitive apparatus developed and used by scientists are informed by the values by these values as well and then go beyond the purely descriptive 
um, this applies in psychiatry as an extension of a, a scientific discipline. And psych psychiatrists are therefore plausibly collaborating with each other and patients, although perhaps not always equally, on not just epistemic goals, so learning about people with mental disorder, but also non-epistemic and social goals, such as delineating the domain of mental disorder for medical intervention and who can be involved, for example. So this leads me to state that psychiatric concepts can reasonably partake in mind-shaping processes, which makes these concepts analogous to folk psychological categories. Um, so one one more thing we might have to kind of like establish here is um, I think that the psychiatry is participating in the same kinds of activity, but are they the using the same kinds of tool set? And I think we have kind of maybe like four good reasons to think that um, psychiatric concepts are like the same kinds of tools we use in mind shaping, which are folk psychological categories. Um, two reasons are kind of like two different case studies and two other reasons I think are more facts about what psychiatrists do. So in the first case study, which I borrow from um, Chapman and Carell, um, in their paper, they discuss how um, autism is diagnosed, such that um, into the, built into the diagnosis of autism is this assumption that people with autism suffer. And as such, autism is diagnosed with that kind of idea in mind. And it makes it difficult for individuals with an autism diagnosis to actually picture and imagine uh, living well with autism. Um, and what this kind of like case study shows is that certain psychiatric concepts have assumptions and ex expectations built in. And this is the same way in which when we categorize a kind of person using our folk psychological categories, that comes with it for free, expectations about what they should be like and how they should behave and what they should experience. Um, so in that way, psychiatric concepts are behaving just like folk psychological concepts under mind shaping. The other example is kind of um, they, the psychiatric concepts exhibit similar kind of looping effects to other kinds of um, folk psychological categories we might see. So um, Haslam, for example, notes in kind of the um, uh, the development of the DSM over time, the categories have both widened and deepened. And this is in response to kind of like growing identification with particular diagnostic labels. And as such, uh, because people, more and more people have become visible as being diagnosed with particular disorder and other people have therefore uh, identified with their symptoms and with their diagnosis, Due to kind of like individual differences, the category and the diagnosis itself has to kind of generalize out in order to cover these new cases. And this creates a situation where the criteria then has to widen in response. And as more people then begin to identify with that new category, that then has to widen to encompass even more people. And so you get this kind of like feedback loop between being categorized and how that changes one's behavior and how that feeds back into what are the norms and expectations behind the original category. Um, and the last two points I think are just very general and maybe kind of like very obvious points about how psychiatry works in practice. It is first off uh, a discipline that classifies people and is a discipline that uses people to classify people. Um, and that in that sense, you know, it's there's, there's the same kind of like function that people are playing in uh, psychiatry as in mind shaping. Um, people are classifying people in order to understand them in mind shaping and our general social interactions. And people are also classifying people to understand them in psychiatry. But we're also doing this in both cases in order to do something about it. Um, so what mind shaping does is it tells us how to act and how to behave based on a kind of category in play. Uh, so it gives us these appropriate avenues for action. And psychiatry is doing just this. We want to be able to categorize people in order to know what to do with them. Um, and so we need to kind of like categorize people with a particular kind of concept to know where the appropriate place to intervene is, whether it's to intervene on kind of like on a cognitive level or on a biological level. 
irrespective of your kind of like underpinning of your um, psychiatric concept, we have these concepts in order to know what to do with them. And that, uh, in my opinion, completely marries the uh, connection between psychiatric concepts and folk psychological categories in mind shaping, uh, such that I think that psychiatric concepts fall under that umbrella and therefore will be the tools used by mind shaping processes uh, of all of those involved in the medical sciences. Um, so lastly, I want to very quickly just kind of like draw on some conclusions based on this analysis. So mind shaping clearly doesn't apply to all objects of scientific inquiry. Mind shaping happens in cases of categorization of people because people are cognitive agents that are aware of and partake in normal uh, normative social structures and therefore have the capacity to re respond to categorization. However, due to this, regardless of any naturalistic foundation uh, to your concept of disorder, mind shaping will go on wherever there is social understanding and social coordination going on. And this makes psychiatric kinds moving targets. Mind shaping explains the adaptation of diagnostic tools as pointed out by Haslam and should predict it also. This isn't necessarily a problem for psychiatric research as long as we keep abreast of those changes. We should also focus on why the changes are happening, who is included and who is excluded and what expectations these groups respond to. By including some and excluding other, there's the potential there to cause harm. Um, and so for me, that kind of like conclusion from this kind of analysis is an emphasis on user-led programs and user-led research. This is something that's already been called for by um, quite a number of researchers. Um, one example is, is Cooper, who wants um, not just user-led research, but also a plurality of different models. So that would mean, in my case, um, a plurality of different kinds of psychiatric concepts working simultaneously. But I don't think that ontological equality among models necessitates that they're each prescriptively equal. We could have one model that has more prescriptive force than another or stronger expectations than another. So different models could be differently influential on people's behavior. So my emphasis instead is on uh, lending voices to patients and, and service users so that they have a say on what norms and expectations should be in play. And that way people will be able to kind of um, have more self-determination in terms of what they feel should be expected of them, what they feel like they are capable of, and whether they feel like something is appropriate or inappropriate. Um, and based on that, I feel like our research could potentially be not just like more ontologically honest by emphasizing how it shapes the natural processes of experience and behavior, but also more ethically conscious as well. That's it. Thank you all for listening.